throughout history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed and precision. You're over. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. Oh my God. Right here on The Butcher. My name is Chris. My passion for being a butcher is strong. I didn't grow up in it, but developed this appreciation. I have a ruler tattooed on my finger. It comes in quite handy. My name is Cindy. I'm five foot five. I don't think size really matters as a butcher. You just have to use your head. I like to get messy. I like noise, I like moving around. Game on. My name is Armand. I'm pretty confident going into this competition. I know what I'm doing. I know what the end result should be. There's not many meats that I can't cut. I'm Seth from Creston, Ohio. I started at 14 years old and cut my teeth on a kill floor. I've tried to train myself to stay focused. I, I try not to let things distract me. Sometimes my friends will comment on my crazy eyes I get going on. Welcome. We're gonna find out which one of you has the goods to be named butcher champion and walk out of here with $10,000. Next to me are three people with the judging skills as sharp as the knives in your scabbards. He's an expert in technique and affectionately known in the industry as the Reverend of Fat, Michael Sully Sullivan. She's an avid hunter, whole animal butcher, and a rising star chef, Roxanne Spruance. Last but certainly not least, he's a fourth generation butcher with over 30 years of experience in San Francisco's best butcher shops. Dave the Butcher Budworth. I recognize Sully. Lots of respect for that guy. He's a legend. It's kind of exciting to see these familiar faces and people that I idolize. Butchers, how many of you here hunt? One? Well, I'm gonna bet that you might feel pretty good about this first challenge. And I'm curious to see how the rest of you are gonna react when you see what it is you're working on. You wanna take a peek? Oh yeah. yeah. Turn around, take a look into the meat locker. Whoa. <laughs> Axis deer. Yes! I see those deer carcasses. Man, I got this cat in the bag. Cut many a deer in my life, but it's been a while. So it's got to be at least 15 years. Based on artifacts found in Germany, man has been hunting deer for more than 350,000 years. Here in America, the natives relied on deer for their food and clothing. And today, it remains a popular game animal and menu item in many parts of the country. For this challenge, you will carry your deer to your block and then break it down into three primal sections, starting with the hind legs, then onto the shoulder, and finally, the saddle. One more thing. You're not gonna get to using your knives to break down the primals. What you will use is this, a flint-bladed knife. Flint blade, which is essentially a sharp rock. I gotta get through bone with this thing. The history of sharp stone tools dates back millions of years. Archaeologists in Kenya found stone blades more than 500,000 years old. Blades were fashioned by chipping off sharp flakes of stone from larger rocks in a process called flint napping. These were crucial tools for prehistoric man's survival. Today, only a select few still create stone knives, mostly as collector's items. Once you have primaled your deer, you will then get to use your knives in your scabbards to make your cuts. You will cut those primals into as many retail cuts as possible. Any of your cuts that do not meet the judge's standards will be rejected. The three butchers that yield the most cuts will move on to round two. All right, butchers, let's do this and choose your deer. Roxanne, you're a hunter. What should they be looking for? This is really a test of whether these butchers know the anatomy of a game animal. Since tenderloins are so prized, before breaking the deer into primals, I'd get that tenderloin. It's always the first thing that you do. Otherwise, you'll cut right through it and ruin it. The tenderloin straddles the saddle and hind leg primals, and it's worth more hole than cut. Ready, sit, cut! Oh, he's very nice of Armand to help her with her deer. 
I'm building a strategy of what I need to start with. I get those tender loins out first. That way I could work on my hindquarters and not chance cutting into those. Armand is here going for his tender loins. Now Seth is the first to start breaking down his deer with the flint knife. The bushers must use the ancient tool until all three primals are cut. Dave, have you ever cut meat with a flint knife? <laughs> no. It's one step above a butter knife. <laughs> Historically, the indigenous people that were using tools like that, it, it wasn't to cut into primals. Those didn't exist then, right? You were skinning hides, and then you were just roasting these whole. Cutting with a rock. I got to go in and just score the vertebrae so I can get my primal loose, then I can pull it over the table and just break it. Oh, look at that. Now, Cindy using her body weight. I have a little judo training, which taught me about leverage. And if I use my head, I don't have to use my strength. Cindy didn't take her tenderloins, did she? You can see them cut through right there. It looks like Chris cut right through his tenderloins <laughs> yeah. instead of removing them. That's really unfortunate that we're seeing that here. Yeah, yeah, Chris is still trying to figure out how to most effectively use that flint knife. Just getting the knife cleanly cut through the animal is definitely a challenge. I mean, you're using a rock, literally. Oh, oh sounds like you just broke the tip of the yeah, flint. Uh, I think I heard that. It's definitely the worst. Super challenging. On the flint knife, the top side of it had some teeth. I was able to use that as a little saw blade. Seth is the first one to break his meat into three primals. He can now put down that flint knife, grab his regular knives, and start working on that hind leg. A skilled butcher should be able to get seven types of cuts from the hind leg primal. Today, we're focusing on venison jerky and stew meat. This is the round tip. I'm cutting a little bit of jerky out of this bottom round. Do the bottom round, it's part of the leg. It's got kind of a tough texture. When you're cutting meat for jerky, you're gonna cut it a little bit thicker because it is going to shrink down so much as it dehydrates during the jerkying process. Doesn't need to be refrigerated. I keep emergency jerky in my car all the time. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it doesn't go bad. I know. I work at White Feather Meats, home of the Bearded Butchers. It's a family-run business. My brothers are also bearded. I started in the butcher industry, butchering beef, bison, ostrich, you name it. I really like watching Armand over here. He's like one of the guys I learned from. You can see the passion he has. My dad owned a meat store, and when he retired, I took it over. And what I did was fill a 20-foot case with all fresh meats every day. Nice to see the customers when they come in to tell you how beautiful your display is. When I got to the bottom of the round, I figured that would be a good piece for jerky. I sliced that long ways, sort of like a slice of bacon. I like to use a cullet knife. This particular one was given to me by my godfather, Manny Rucci, who's 89 and still cutting meat. Armand's jerky cuts are a little too thin and uneven. Sus are looking great. Chris is the third to finish breaking his deer into primals. He can now start using his own knives on the hind leg primal. I feel super relieved. It's just night and day difference using a, a rock and a really sharp knife. Chris seems to be in a more comfortable place now. Cut this a little differently than I usually do. I'm not really confident with that bandsaw, so I'm just gonna bone this out full. I work at the Davis Food Co-op. At UC Davis, we process all the animals raised by the students there, and I mentor the students on every aspect of the meat industry. I went up to UC Davis to get my pre-vet degree, but I got involved with the slaughterhouse, and they got its claws in me. Cindy is working on another cut from the hind leg. I'm gonna cut some stew out of that. They're doing this stew meat, David. How big do you like those cubes? An inch or so. I want it to be nice and uniform so it has an eye appeal to it. Also gonna cook a lot more evenly. I start working on the stew meat. This is something that we do at the shop, so it's definitely familiar. Stew meat is just what it is. It's pretty easy to do. There isn't any bones or anything to worry about. Seth is finishing up. It looks beautiful. Oh, his leg. Armand bringing cuts down to his presentation table. He and Seth are moving on to their second primal. An expert butcher ought to be able to get five cuts from the shoulder primal. Today, our judges will be focusing on the boneless shoulder roast, which is a large deboned section of that shoulder. Seth is removing the front legs out of the shoulder primal. There's a boneless shoulder roast in there, and he just separated that cut. Ooh, that could cost him. It's interesting. Seth is removing the front legs out of the shoulder primal. Ooh, that could cost him. There's a boneless shoulder roast in there, and he just separated that cut. So, so he's not going to be able to do a boneless shoulder yeah, roast? He can't. Mm -hmm. So he just ruined that one whole shoulder cut. 
Armand's actually taking the front legs off as well. He's not going to be able to do that shoulder roast either. You know, judges, it's important to keep in mind, while the butchers are trying to put as many cuts as possible on the table, if they don't meet your standards, they are going to be rejected. Chris is now done with his hind leg primal. He's moving on to the shoulder. I have a small butcher shop, Bolliards. It's been open for about four years. I've been a chef most of my career, but along the way, I came to love butchering, just transforming an entire animal into everything and anything, not letting anything go to waste. 30 minutes down, butchers, one hour remaining. Cindy is last to finish her hind leg primal. I still have my whole shoulder and the saddle left to do, and I need to speed it up. Cindy is now working on that shoulder primal. It looks like she's boning out the neck. The neck is a tough one because the bones are really interconnected. She's okay. coming in on the atlas bone on that joint. And there it went. That's a beautiful technique. As a smaller cutter myself, the use of anatomy is so, so helpful. Seth is leading the pack with 11 cuts, while Cindy pulling up the rear with six cuts. Neither Cindy nor Seth have pulled out any butcher paper. There's an enzyme in it that helps the meat not turn too quick, and it makes it look nice. There's a good part of this competition that's presentation. So if we give you paper, use paper. You can see here all the juices coming out. It drives me crazy. I get my shoulder all set out for presentation, and I'm moving on to the final primal. A butcher may be able to pull five types of cuts from the last primal, the saddle. Today, our judges will be focused on the back strap and Frenched rack. Seth is going to the bandsaw, and I think he's going to do all of his bandsaw work at one time, and everything's going to be clean. Mm -hmm. So he's breaking down the saddle all at the same time. Butchers, we are halfway through this competition. 45 minutes remaining. Seth's pulling his back strap right now. Yep. That's the tenor meat along both sides of the backbone. Nice, long, smooth cuts, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. My favorite knife to use is a six inch boning knife with a rosewood handle. I notch all my knives so my brothers don't steal them. If I have this in my hand and I don't have that notch, it just doesn't feel right. You want to flay this like a fish. Look how clean he's doing with that silver skin. Just one easy, yep. beautiful knife stroke. I've got the silver skin cleaned off. We'll wrap this thing up here pretty soon. Cindy is still on her second primal. She's working on that shank in boneless shoulder roast. The worst injury I've had, I hit my leg with my knife, and it's bleeding quite a bit. So someone takes me to the hospital. They're like, you were very close to your femoral artery. I would have bled out in minutes. She's trying to find her arm and scapula bone to get that out, and then she can tie all that up and make a really nice roast. Once that's cooked, you can just slice down towards the shank, and every slice you take off, you're still going to have this beautiful presentation. I'm doing my shoulder roast. Nope. And my cleaver is just sliding off the edge. Well, we saw Cindy trying to cleaver her way through, now has opted for the handsaw, but there's just nowhere to get leverage. Did you see that she just put the other half of the shoulder mm -hmm. on top of that piece to give her some weight? But yeah. I'm worried that she's actually gonna nick into her meat that she just nah. put on top of there. I don't have a lot of experience with that bandsaw, so I saw through it, and then I can put the cleaver right in that little nook and just hammer my way through that. I bone out the shoulder and start tying and hoping that this comes out nice and uniform. Cindy's shoulder roast looks super nice. All her strings are even. I like her tying a lot. Why is the tying important? The main reason is so that it cooks evenly. And again, unlike Armand and Seth, she did not take her front legs off. Yep. You know, so she really got all of that meat, and that is done properly. We got to see if they're going to get creative, try to fool us a little bit. All right. With that roast done, Cindy jumped ahead of Armand in completed primals. I'm working on that shoulder roast. That's yeah, it looks like he's French the arm bone. Mm -hmm. I'm nervous for Armand. He's still on that shoulder. That's right. All other contestants are now working on their third and final primal. I know I have work to do still, but I have to speed it up a little bit. Armand, now he's dropped his shoulder pieces, going to the bandsaw. It looks like he's trimming up that sap. While Armand starts his saddle, Chris and Cindy are working on their back straps, and Seth is on the last cut from the third primal. We're going to make a Frenched rack of venison next. 
Seth took his meat hook, got that sinew yeah. loose. Love seeing that technique. I really enjoy cutting like the French style roast and making them look cool. I'm trimming the meat in between the bones to create those special French cuts. And when we talk about anything that's French, what you're looking for is these beautiful pieces of white, clean bone. Look at Seth's bones, nice, long. It's like those tomahawk. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful when you get all that meat cleaned off. Anything that is left on there is going to turn gray when you cook it. So you really want to make sure that that's all off. Love seeing that tie work between those bones. And that's so important on meat like that because it's so loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You tighten it up, you know, it's going to cook nice. Butchers, one hour has expired. You have 30 minutes left. The time factor has to start catching up right now. Yeah. I mean, they can feel the clock. And my last cut I have to make is the rack. It's going to be challenging just because of the nature of the meat. <laughs> it's not my best work. <laughs> Looks pretty sad, actually. As time goes by, I feel like I'm sacrificing quality of the cuts and craftsmanship. And I want to try and get everything done before the time expires. When I French the rack, I realized that I had snapped one of the rib bones when I was breaking the animal in the primals. I think for sure that I'm not going to make it. Seth is the first to finish his cuts from the three primals. I went ahead and got all my cuts done, and now what I'm going to do is go through the trimmings because we want to use everything on this deer. We're in the final stretch here, butchers. Ten minutes remaining. I'm running out of time. I just got to give him a rack. I'm trying to tie it up and it cooks nice and even. You see where she just tied the strings? Yeah. pulling into the meat. I can't see the meat because she's left so much sinew on all top right. of it. Butchers, one minute remaining. I'm looking down the line. I feel really good. Dave, what is Seth doing over there? He's done with what he wants to present. Go through and make sure you didn't miss anything. Use your time. Five, four, three, two, one. Time, step back from your block. Well done, butchers. Unfortunately for one of you, this will be your last cut. Please head to the stock room while the judges inspect your work. <laughs> oh, man, that was, that awesome. was not easy. OK, judges. Chris has displayed 16 cuts. One of the things I really like is the stew meat. Mm -hmm. Clean, very mm -hmm. consistent in size, so it's going to cook evenly. On the bigger end of the mistake, he broke that hind quarter off, but he didn't pull his tenderloins out first. This is driving me absolutely insane. We've actually got some broken bones here, guys. When I was using the flint knife to separate the shoulder from the saddle, I broke one of the rib bones, so oh, the wow. rack kind of suffered. All right, Cindy has displayed 15 cuts. One thing that really impresses is her tying. Absolutely beautiful, very even on the strings. Look at her boneless shoulder rows. Really nice and even. Look at how this will present. And the consistency in all of her cubed meat, very even sizes. On the offside, it's a beautiful French rack, but she left all the silver skin, which is going to be really tough. That's day one you learn to do that. Here we are at Armand's presentation. He has put down 15 cuts. I'm liking his tenderloins. I mean, really even. I really like the technique on that. Is that because he pulled them out before breaking the deer into primals? Mm -hmm. Yep. This boneless shoulder roast. He ruined that shoulder cut, just separated that cut. Should have left this on, not what we were looking for here. It's really falling apart. The strings aren't really tight. Those jerky cuts, a lot of uneven stuff there. Mm -hmm. Attic problems with the jerky. It was tough. All right, judges, Seth has displayed 15 cuts. What is the very first thing that catches your attention when we come up to this presentation table? Um, the black paper. It's what we use in butcher shop. There's actually like an enzyme in it that helps the meat not turn too quick. But Seth didn't. And you can see here, it's not blood. It's just all the moisture rendering out. If this was your case and a customer walked up, do you think somebody would buy this? I love the length of these bones on this rack. Got all that back membrane off. I really like the long back strap. This is cleaned absolutely beautifully. Driving us crazy, this boneless shoulder roast. Again, they missed that first cut. Compared to what Cindy put down on the mm -hmm. table. Exactly. It's, it's hard to even realize that they're the same cut. Butchers, your cuts have been counted. You all had some cuts that were rejected. And one cut is the difference between moving on or going home. Butchers, the one with the fewest number of cuts is going home. We have a tie for the most cuts at 14 total. Congratulations, 
Cindy and Chris. Both of you are moving on to the next round. You can head back to your block. Nice work. <laughs> Seth and Armand, it is down to the two of you. Armand, your final count is 12. Seth, your final cut total is 13 cuts. Congratulations, and you can head back to your block. Dave, any final words for Armand? You're a great cutter. You come out of the generation of my mentors and the guys I worked with, but we had to pull a few of your cuts. Your jerky cuts, are, they're a little bit uneven, but I wish you the best. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thank you. I'm disappointed. You'd never expect to win it all, but you always hope you can. Other than that, it was great. The people, my competitors, it was an awesome experience. No regrets. Butchers, there are three of you left, but only one of you can claim the $10,000 prize. Feels a little like we're raising the stakes, which is exactly what we call this next challenge. As you know, Butchers, cutting even pieces of meat to the correct thickness is an integral part of your craft. A true master butcher should not only be able to cut a piece of meat to a customer's specified thickness, but they should also be able to do it without the use of a ruler. So here's the challenge. You're each going to start with a beef short loin subprimal, which is where the New York strip steaks come from. You will first break out the New York strip from your short loin. From that, you must hand cut a total of six properly trimmed New York strip steaks to exact thickness. First, you will cut one steak at exactly 1.5 inches thick. Next, two steaks at exactly one inch thick. And finally, three steaks at three quarters of an inch thick. When you think you have your steak cut to spec, you must bring it up to Sully to be measured. If your steak is over or under, it will be rejected. First two butchers to successfully cut their steaks will advance, go head to head in that final challenge. The other butcher will be eliminated from the competition. Immediately, I think this is something I do every day. I feel like it's gonna go by pretty quick. Chris, understand you might have a tattoo on your finger, is that correct? That's correct. What exactly is that tattoo? It's a ruler. It's been tattooed Whoa. on my finger. Love your commitment to your craft, brother, but we are gonna have to cover that thing up for the challenge. Understandable, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little disappointed, but rules are rules. All right, let's do this, butchers. On my go, ready, set, cut. We can't use a ruler. When I'm cutting steaks back at the shop, I have a ruler right on my saw, so I'm constantly going back to that. It's literally just gonna be your eyesight. Game on. When you have multiple steaks that you're selling to one person for cooking, they need to be an even cut all the way across, which is why Sully is measuring them from all four points. So the New York is basically the back strap. You can see Chris, he's getting to what we call the finger bones. When you're boning out those finger bones, it's really hard to not gouge into the New York strip itself. Jeez, I got the fat one. Also, with that fat cap, it makes it really stiff, mm -hmm. so you can't quite, like, peel it up from the ribs. I've got my short loin. It is fat. Oh, that's bad. It's cutting blind here. It's hard to cut through it. God, it's a mean fat cap. Oh, that's bad. This isn't good. Why did I pick this one? Oh, no. First, you will cut one steak at exactly 1.5 inches thick. Two steaks at one inch thick. And finally, three steaks at three quarters of an inch thick. Cindy, first one to make her way up to Sully. Seth, in line right behind Cindy. Very nice trim steak. You're a little over and a little under on certain areas. So Cindy, her first steak doesn't pass the Sully. They need to be an even cut all the way across. If you have one end that's thicker and one end that's thinner, you're not gonna be able to get a consistent cook on them. Your steak is one and a half inch trimmed, but we have a little bit too much of a fat cap here. I will have to disapprove of this. Ooh, these are supposed to be case-ready steaks. I wouldn't have put it in my case. I gotta go through this thing again. I'm hoping to get that first steak on the board because I wanna intimidate my competitors a little bit. Chris, your steak is a little over and a little under on certain areas. This is gonna become more of a mind game than anything else. Your steak is still uneven. Seth is getting his second steak measured. Seth, 
we have a beautiful one and a half inch there strip it is. steak. First steak on the board, I'm like, yes. You know, I feel good. My competitors don't have one yet. Anybody that's in the lead, trying to catch up with them, that can add more anxiety and stress. Chris is still trying to get on the board. Very beautiful one and a half inch cut. Chris, he's now moving on to the one inch steaks. He needs a pair of those. Feeling pretty good. Trying to nail it, it's pretty tough. Seth is getting measured. You have two beautiful one-inch steaks. Wow. wow. He's now moving on to the three-quarter-inch steaks. He needs three of those. I'm not feeling 100% confident. Cindy, still trying to get that 1.5-inch <clears throat> steak. Chris, you have two beautiful one-inch cuts. I'm going to accept this one. I'm going to reject this one. A little too much fat for the display case. Now Chris needs four more steaks total. All right, Cindy, here we go. I, I kind of hope Cindy gets one on the board. You have a beautiful one and a half inch. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, <laughs> Cindy's in the go. competition. About right. time. I've got my one and a half. Now that that's dialed in, I can just mentally do the math for the rest of them. Seth needs three more steaks to advance. Seth, you are over on all three steaks. Cindy, you have two beautiful one-inch steaks. Oh, oh, look at that. That's like that. Cindy leapfrogs Chris. Once you get one on the board, it changes yeah, your whole perspective. Beautiful one-inch. Oh. There it is. We're tied up. So far, we have one approved. OK, wow. moving on to steak number two. Your steak is uneven. Another approved steak. There we go. Bam, I've got two. I'm down to one more steak, and I can win this thing. Cindy coming back up with three steaks that she likes. Cindy, one makes the cut, one is over, and one is under. Cindy needs two more. Chris needs all three of his three-quarter inch steaks. This could be it for Seth. Seth, congratulations. You are the first to make there the cut. There it is. Yes. I made it. I'm moving on to the next round. So I'm feeling really good. Cindy working on her final two. Cindy. Your measurements are correct, but we're over trimming some of the meat. This is not what I would consider a New York strip. She's at her sirloin end where it tapers, yeah. and he's rejecting it. Oh. I deserved that one, but it's OK. I've got the measurement dialed in. Now she's got to go bone another short one out. Oh my god. I'm not even going to bone this thing out. I'm just going to pull off a little chunk. She's only boning out half that New York instead of going for the whole thing. It's really smart. Chris, you're still over. The pressure's really on. I'm concerned with Cindy getting all the cuts before I do. Cindy, you have another three-quarter inch strip, but unfortunately on this one, you are still over. Cindy is just one steak away from advancing. Chris, you have two beautiful steaks, but we're over oh, on your third. Oh, snap, we're tied again. Oh. Chris and Cindy are now racing to get their final steak approved by Sully. Cindy almost can't stand to watch. Chris, now right behind her, he's waiting in line. I'm thinking, oh great, I'm gonna go home if he accepts her steak. Unfortunately, your steak is not even. It does not make the cut. No! <laughs> it's uneven! Chris steps up to Sully, wasting no time. She's hustling over there. Chris. Congratulations. Oh, there it is. Oh. Damn it. There it is. You have a Chris. beautiful three quarters of an inch. Chris. Wow. Chris, moving on in this competition. I'm so excited. There's so much pressure built up and anxiety, and it all kind of goes away when he said I made it. I couldn't be happier. Cindy, you lost by that much. Cindy, the stakes I had to reject, they were overly trimmed and didn't represent a New York strip. Cindy, thank you for being here. It is time to exit the shop. Thank you, guys. It's awesome. a hell of a time. Good luck. All right, good luck. It was very challenging. I did give it everything I had. The guys I was up against are pretty darn good. It's a bummer, but it's fair. Seth, Chris, you have made it to the final battle. I feel confident. My skills have been tested. Let's do it. Given that I'm standing next to a tall black curtain, you might be wondering what hairy situation is waiting for you on the other side. We call this next challenge, Meet the Beast, and this is why. <laughs> <laughs>
wild boar. <laughs> I'm excited, but I'm also scared because I'm not exactly sure what's going to be asked of us. Growing up, people would bring in wild boar, and then we would process it for them. This shouldn't be too difficult. The wild boar is the largest of the wild pigs, native to forests in Europe, North Africa, and China, before being introduced to the United States in the 1500s by Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto. Unlike their domestic counterparts, these feral hogs have an extremely tough shoulder hide comprised of scar tissue due to the boar fighting in the wild. These boars will eat most anything, and they are known for devouring entire fields of crops. It's estimated that feral pigs caused $1.5 billion of damage every year. Your challenge is to butcher an entire boar and then create as many retail cuts as possible. The judges will assess the quality of your cuts, weigh the pieces, and then add up the total value of your yield. This is a test of your ability to maximize the value of this animal. Wild boars usually net $750, but a master butcher can net up to $1,500 from this beast. And now, for that hairy situation, you're going to have to skin it on the rail. Skinning, that's a whole different ball game. It's not something I know by second nature. My jaw about hit the floor. Whenever you have an animal in a cooler, with, it's gonna be harder to skin versus warm. You have two hours and 15 minutes for this challenge, and I can assure you the two you will be working on are a hell of a lot bigger than this little piggy. We turn around. Jesus. There's this massive wild boar crap. I've broken down a lot of pigs, but that's a big one. And when you throw in the skinning, this is gonna be a challenge. It is time to pick your pork. Butchers, on my go. Three, two, one, cut! Any keys to making a successful skin of this animal? You gotta get just that skin off. You don't want that knife going into the meat. You're gonna wanna cut around the ankles, and you can just peel it right down. I don't have much of an issue getting the skin started on the shanks and around the neck. I just put my head down and work as fast as I can. I've gotta start at the head, save the jowls, skin around the shoulders, pull that height all the way down past the hams. Seth, he's the hunter, got lots of experience field dressing. I'm not sure Chris has ever skinned an animal. Seth is taking the head right off there at that atlas bone. That last big bone in the neck that controls your head, he's using his leverage and taking it from under the chin. Once he snapped that bone, he can get through the cartilage and take the head so off. So he should be able to remove this whole head with just his knife. I'd be surprised if he pulled a saw out. Having a little bit of difficulty getting that head off, kind of just give it a snap, break that knuckle. I was surprised that he didn't skin that down first, then remove the head. So, different technique. First, he's going down to the legs, working a little bit, then he's going back up. He should just start bringing that skin down. The most challenging part about skinning this pig is it's cold and that skin sticks to the meat. So it just takes a lot more of your force, your upper body strength. I knew that I could use some downward pressure and pull that hide off that carcass. I mean, he's just pulling that skin down, using that knife just to help him. There it is. Chris going for his head. He's gonna use a saw. Instead of using leverage like Seth did, I wonder if he's just feeling the pressure. If he gets it done, he gets it done. And there it is. Done. He's off with it and moving on. Seth grabbing himself a handsaw back into the meat locker. We have a splitting saw at the shop. It has a big handle and a big electric motor, and you... We don't use a handsaw. I hear him using the saw, splitting the animal. I'm really, really behind. So Seth has his wild boar split completely in half. If I was Chris, it's got to get in your head a little bit. I really start to struggle starting in between the shoulders and along the back and gashing up the fat. When it comes to skinning, I've done it before, but it's not something I've done over and over. Look at that leg. He's really gotten into it and gouged. Chris is trying to cut that skin all the way off. Put the knife down, get that skin, and just start pulling. Seth has made it out of the meat locker. Definitely not his first rodeo. I'm pretty frazzled. I have to play catch up again. I just want to get it off the rail as soon as possible. Oh, there we go. Butchers, one hour, 45 minutes remaining. Chris is still struggling with that skin. He sees where Seth is. He's like, can I just get this skin right. off? Finally. So I got my first half down the table. First thing I cut out is a little oyster steak inside that hip bone. I grab my handsaw and I go for the hand. Break the shoulder off. And the next step I want to do with that shoulder is break it down into my roasts. 
for that middle section. I separate the bacon, spare ribs, and then I start on my loin. Okay, Chris is through. Now you're in your element. It's a sense of relief once I get it on the table, but Seth's amazing butcher and he's blowing through it. All I can think is I have a long way to go. He's got to go now. So judges, where's the biggest money, the biggest value going to be from this boar? T-bone, a French rib rack. Country ribs, you take pork belly, roll it up and tie it, and get a lot more value out of it. Comparing a wild boar to pig, I'm sure there are differences once you get into the muscles of it. The actual marbling, that intermuscular meat, is much leaner than normal. Because they're in the wild. All that roaming is going to give you tougher and richer muscles. That's a country-style rib. He's putting in a beautiful case, but I don't see a lot of added value, creativity. Looks like we're rolling over here. Nice. I'm doing a porchetta, but a traditional Italian porchetta is boneless loin wrapped in belly. Now we got some creativity. Mm -hmm. Just increase your value by 30% and you just roll that up. Gentlemen, one hour remaining. Seth's pulling his second half. I'm managing my time fairly well. I'm confident I can beat Chris. I'm freaking out because I have an hour left and have a whole nother side to tackle. I think he's kind of out of it mentally at this point. It's time to really get moving. Your challenge is to butcher an entire boar. The judges will add up the total value of your yield. And I'm really getting concerned with Chris now. He's got another whole side of pig. As Seth continues to lay down cuts. Still not seeing a lot of creativity. I'm cutting up the belly. I'm trimming the meat in between the bones to make a real nice French cut. That's a value cut of French rack. Just going to tighten that up, let it cook evenly. Beautiful. I'm cutting some pork steaks now. I'm from St. Louis, so you see a lot of people eating pork steaks. He cut a lot of blade steaks. Where I would cut a blade steak from, it doesn't go that deep. So he broke that, but it gives him those extra blade steaks. It's a totally different style. You know, I don't see it very often. Part of my plan is to showcase more versatility and a little bit of my style. Flank is a definitely another one of those. It's a fun cut. You never see it in stores anyway. He's pulling the flank out of his pork, which oh, nice. is a really nice touch instead of just throwing it in his ground meat. Chris is definitely approaching this from a much more creative standpoint. And these rare cuts are gonna boost his value. Some bone-in pork chops. French rack. Boston butt. We're at the half hour mark, gentlemen. 30 minutes remaining. Got all my cuts out there. I can start making some sausage. Seth's got the grinder. He's yes. going on to sausage. You take a product that's really hard to cook and eat and increase the value three to four times. What makes quality sausage? That fat to lean ratio. You want the proper amount because you don't want a dry sausage. Also, the last thing that you want in a sausage is air. Yep. Chris has moved on to the second side of his wild boar. It's not looking good for me. I'm completely in the weeds. But one of my hobbies is ultra running. Anything that's over a standard marathon, it's just something I've really gotten into and keeps me sane. Running has given me the mindset to endure. Even when you're feeling like and you're behind, try to focus at the task at hand and don't give up. Don't ever give up. Look how Chris's table's coming together. He really pushed. We're down to the wire. We're down to our final three minutes here, guys. So now I need to grind as much of the trimmings because it's not gonna do me any good lying on the butcher block. Why would you start salting grind with how much time he has left? No way he could stuff it. Is he gonna try to make patties or make it as a sausage product? What we would be looking for if it's salted is a double grind to help bind it or mixing it together enough that you could call it bulk sausage. But this is basically an unfinished product. 10 seconds, nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. All right, butchers, head back to the stock room while the judges scrutinize your cuts. Good luck to you both. At the end of the day, pretty knife work really doesn't matter. The cut can't make it to the plate. Hey, Roxanne, have you made your mind up on what you're going to grill for us today? Both these guys did T-bones, so okay. I'm going to grill those and reject the cuts that can't take the heat. Did your hands start hurting from pulling on that? Yeah, hand? yeah, my hands definitely uh, were feeling it. Let's start with Seth. I love some of his cuts, like these country ribs. They're very even, enough meat on them. Love to take those to the grill. I really like his rack. He took the time to tie it. It's chined. See that cap? Amazing flavor. I'm a sausage guy. 
but there's a lot of air. These will become very dry. In the end, we saw him making all that ground meat. But you see how much salt he added? It's, it's just not blended properly. I wouldn't put that in my case. So we've got T-bones from Chris and Seth. Seth is a little bit thinner, whereas Chris is, is a bit thicker. So let's see how these cook up. Here we are at Chris's presentation. I like his bone-in blade chops. This is one of my favorite steaks. He actually pulled the flank steak out, and you don't see pork flanks. They make a great stir fry or even just to grill up. I think that's a beautiful thing. On this porchetta, I love that he left the belly onto the loin, bringing extra value to it, but he should have faced it off here, faced it off here, and make it prettier. They are a different thickness, but they both cut really nicely. They're both cutting well. They're both really delicious. Both of these cuts are even in quality and value. Neither will be rejected. You gentlemen have a lot to do to determine your valuation. I will let you get to it. Good luck. Excellent. Thank you. If I win the money, it will just go back into the shop. We've been around for four years, and we need to take it to that next level. It's important for me to win this competition to go back to my little hometown as a champion. You definitely displayed some amazing skills, and I'm honored to be up against you. Judges, have you determined which butcher has the highest value? Yes, yeah. sir. Let's bring them back into the shop. Seth. Yes, sir. It's clear you have experience skinning animals and certainly with boar. You have an impressive yield. Chris, you struggled skinning that boar and it put you behind, but you used your skills just like you've done all day long to get you back in this competition. Seth, your final value is $1,510. Chris, your final value is $1,553. $53. Congratulations, Chris. Oh my God. I can't believe it. No way. Congratulations. Oh. Unbelievably close here, gentlemen. Seth, you are a fantastic butcher. You've shown a ton of skill. Unfortunately, we had to get rid of your grind. You've just put it through the grinder, salted all the way through. That's not something that you can sell in the case. That's really what did it. Thanks for being here, Seth. It is time for you to leave the shop. Thank you. I lost by $43 value. It's a bummer, but I'm happy for Chris too. Being a family man and owning his business and having little kids, I can relate. And I had a great time competing. It was a blast. Opportunity of a lifetime. Chris, <laughs> are you shocked? Or are you surprised? I'm completely shocked. Oh, Seth is an amazing, talented butcher. I knew he had the skinning experience, so I was already behind the eight ball from the get-go. Well, congratulations, Chris. You are definitely the comeback kid. Thank you. You so are much. the butcher champion and a little bit richer. $10,000 is all yours, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Grab your bag of cash. Enjoy it, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm just beside myself. I think one of the biggest things that I've gotten from this experience is to have a little bit more confidence in myself. And I've had so much support and encouragement from my wife and kids, so I feel incredible. Throughout history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed and precision, you're over. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. Oh! Right here on The Butcher. My name is Eagle. I'm 41 years old and started butchering at 36. I was a computer programmer and I did that for 14 years, but I followed my passion and now I'm doing what I love. I'll butcher anything you put in front of me. The bald eagle is here to play. My name is Tim. I will never claim to be the most experienced butcher or the best butcher. I will claim to be the most passionate. I care more than anyone else cares. 
My name is Jules. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I size everybody up and I'm my biggest competition, always. My strengths as a butcher, I have great precision in understanding my cuts, the quality of cuts, so I'm not going home. My name is Lothar. I'm a German heritage butcher, 55 years old, and I'm butchering 40 years. What I do with pressure, pressure doesn't exist. I keep myself calm and I go step by step. Welcome to the shop. This is the place where your skills as master butchers will be pushed to the limit. In the end, one of you will be the butcher champion and will walk out of here with $10,000. Let's meet your judges. First up, he teaches butchery all across the country and has over 25 years of experience, Michael Sully Sullivan. Up next, she's an avid hunter, an accomplished chef who butchers whole animals, Miss Roxanne Spruance. And finally, a fourth generation butcher who's been honing his craft for over 30 years, Dave the Butcher Budworth. I recognize David Budworth. He is a member of the Butcher's Guild, like me too, and I would like to impress the judges. For this first challenge, you're going to be working with an animal that is a staple in butcher shops around the world. But here in America, less than 50% of us have ever tried it. Turn around, take a look in the meat locker behind you. Oh. Lamb. That is the biggest lamb I've ever seen in my life. Holy <laughs> they're huge. I haven't done a lamb in a hot minute. Lamb is totally not my thing. In my butcher shop, I, I don't sell much lamb. Domesticated in Central Asia more than 10,000 years ago, lamb has been a staple of man's diet throughout most of the world. Lamb has served as an important symbolic figure in many religions, as well as in Greek mythology. While Americans eat less than a pound per year per person, lamb is produced in all 50 states. Hanging from the rail are four whole lambs. You will break down your lamb into four sections you butchers refer to as primals the shoulder, rack, loin, and leg. You will then cut those primals into as many retail cuts as possible. Cuts that do not meet the judge's quality standards are going to be rejected. You will have 90 minutes for this challenge. The three butchers that yield the most cuts will move on to round two. Lamb is popular around the world, so we're adding a twist with some international flair. When you break down your lamb into primals, you're going to use one of these, a copus blade. What the f is that? <laughs> Taken from the Greek word copus, which means to cut or strike, it is distinguished by its forward curving blade. It was used by ancient civilizations during times of war. It has also served as an efficient tool for slaughtering or animal sacrifice. Butchers, please head into the meat lockers, get your copus blade, and choose your lamb. I pick up that copus blade. First thought in my mind is this really heavy. I know the first thing I'm gonna have to do is hit the spine and use it like a cleaver or a machete. On my go. Three, two, one, cut. This will be interesting to see how they do with these copus blades. It's not much different than a scimitar in certain ways. Eagle, he's breaking that chest cavity, getting those ribs to open up so you can actually see. You really want to be able to get in between the ribs at the right spot, because if you go too far up, you're going to be cutting into your racks. Eagle has removed his first primal. He's coming out of the meat locker. Tim just removed his first primal of his lamb, and Jules as well. Lota's the only one still in the meat locker. Roxanne, in terms of difficulty with lamb, is there anything about this that's challenging? The size alone makes it tough. Just for the record, these lamb are huge. These are right? big. These are much bigger than normal. That could get in your head. I get the shoulder on the table, and automatically, I take off the shank. We're not even three minutes into this challenge, and Eagle has already placed his first cut down on the presentation <laughs> table. As many as seven cuts come from the shoulder primal. We're focusing on the neck cuts and round bone chops. I'm seeing Jules with that saw. Looks like she's got her neck. She's got her neck, yeah. Lota's doing some fat trimming on the neck. Butchering is not simply a 
carving a piece of meat. There are hundreds of good butchers, but this makes you not unique. The unique way to be an outstanding butcher is with a wonderful, nice presentation. All right, neck. I take the neck to the machine and cut it into neck cuts and put them on the presentation table. It looks like Eagle's already got more. Is that his neck on the block? Yeah, that's his neck. Some of my family didn't really understand leaving a six-figure computer programming career to follow a passion in butchering. But I found an apprenticeship program, grabbed my dog, I drove cross-country, and decided to pursue a career in the meat industry. I'm gonna finally show my family I am truly meant to be a butcher. Jules now walking up to the bandsaw. Looks like she's getting ready to cross cut her lamb neck. Cutting into what we call wheels. I'm gonna look for her to take the paddy whack out, which is that tendon the animal has to help it lift its head back up. It really is like a rubber band. Unedible unless you cook it down, yes. down, down. There we go. I am a proud business owner of Arcadian Pastures. We're a whole animal butcher shop. I designed this business around people. We put pride into our quality and into our community. That's pretty much our thing, was just creating good quality meats for the neighborhood. I think every community deserves a great butcher shop with great butchers that love their customers and put them first. These are some round bone chops right now. The thing with a round bone, you can only get two off each side of the shoulder. So what you're looking for is a bone about that big. Looks like Eagle's working on his as well over there. Okay. Yep. Once you get past two one-inch cuts, you get into this big round bone, and then you can't display that in your counter, and it's, right. it becomes too much tendon and stuff. It'd be interesting to see if they cut them too thick and they get into that and what it's going to look like right. in the end result. So that's four round bone chops. I have a degree in marketing and communications, but that was not a career path for me. So as soon as I graduated, I was like, I want to find something I'm really into. And the first time I saw someone cut into a whole primal, I was like, this is for me. People don't really understand how important the local butcher is. You have your farmer that raises the animal, and then the butcher is that bridge to feed people. We see Tim going back to that bandsaw. Yeah, he's using the guard to get his perfect one inch cut. Cutting that neck now. Roxanne, oh, you were talking about it. He's removing a paddy whack yep. right there. Nice. Lota moving along at yeah, a sales still pace over here. Trimming. And I don't even know what he's trimming. It's, it's part of the shoulder, but not really a sense of urgency on this one, huh? He has the most experience, so I'm sure he's got a plan at this. I was gonna and say, he may not be sweating it at all. I'm watching him, I want to see a bead of sweat on him. Since I was a kid, I love meat and sausages. When I was 16, when I was in my apprentice and I had a dream, I would like to come to the United States. And I run Lotus Butchering Gourmet Sausages with my lovely wife, June. We are operating in Crossover, Virginia. Hello, good morning. America today we using a nice beef tenderloin. Filet. Filet. We offering around about 150 kinds of sausages. Hello my friends of the good taste. You see how we make the German traditional brats. Cured products including bacon. By Julia Child. The pork belly gets us a nice pork belly massage. You know? <laughs> my teenage dream came true. Butchers, we are halfway through this competition. 45 minutes left in the challenge. I'm like, oh man, this is my second time butchering a lamb, and I'm spending a lot of time on the shoulder, and the bones are super dense. We only have an hour and a half for this competition. We're 45 minutes in, and everyone is still working on their shoulders. I just see no urgency on any of the butchers. I don't see anybody moving as fast as I do on a Saturday morning in my shop when I'm not even in competition. There's no customers there, and I'm just trying to get the case in. Being in competition, you've got to get through these cuts. I don't know if they're daunted by these lambs. They're a little bigger than they might be used to, but still, the lamb, they should be halfway through. 100%. At some point, we've got to speed up and get through. They just chewing up time. Butchers, we are halfway through this competition. 45 minutes left in the challenge. Eagles currently in the lead with seven cuts, while Lotar is trailing all butchers with only three cuts. I'm feeling the pressure of the time, and I know there's a lot more cuts to get through. Moving on. Do you think any of our contestants are going to make it to the legs? It's amazing to me how much more time it takes on a big lamb. Time will tell. Eagle into the meat locker to get his second primal, his rack, where butchers can get two cuts. But our judges are gonna be focused on the French rack. Everybody knows about a French rack of lamb. Bones nice and clean, nice tying on it. 
so that it, we can really present it well and it'll cook evenly. So you're gonna find the spot between the joint. Having to break down the primals with that copus blade is a challenge. I'm gonna score around the primals as best as I can and just hack through the spine. Look at that, he cut them, he broke them. Now he's trying to break that vertebrae, look at that. I look over at the other butchers and people are catching up to me at this point. So it's time to rock out some more cuts out of this big ass rib section in front of me. Butchers, 30 minutes remaining in this challenge. I may be a little behind, but I process the meat more than everybody else. I want to make everything as presentable as possible because I'm less likely to have things rejected by the judges. I get the rack on the table. I'm already pressed for time, so I don't have time to waste Frenching a rack. I need to get other cuts on the presentation table. The eagle took his ribs off each piece, but it doesn't look it like doesn't he look chined. Like he chined it. If you're gonna go to the bandsaw and split your rack of lamb, why wouldn't you just chine it while you're up there? Eagle didn't French it at all. That's just not complete. Jewel's placing the final cuts of her first primal on her presentation table. Now she's moving back into the meat locker to go for her second primal. Lota now moving down to his presentation Yeah, table. he's picking up his peep over there. I'm gonna try to snap this off. All right, going out. Tim just grabbed his second primal. He is tied up with jewels. I have to get my French rack. It's not a lot of meat, so you have to try to present it really nicely. So I have to clean it up and French it. Power machines like the bandsaw can make clean and precise cuts and chines. Now I'm focusing on cleaning up my racks of lamb. I'm pulling out the little bit of cartilage that's left, taking off some fat, and I'm Frenching these bones. So it looks like Jules is Frenching her rack out right now. Did she just cut into her eye? Yes, she did. Ugh, you hate to see that. That's your money, man. Oh my gosh, she's going so far down. When you're Frenching, you get on the backside, you see where your eye is, you make a mark, and you come straight across. She did it blindly and went right into her she eye. She also has her china on still, guys. Jules finishes her French rack, brings it down to the presentation table. And broken bones. And missing a bone. We see Tim with the towel technique. This is how I French racks. You want it to be nice and clean. You don't want anything on there. And once you cut around those rib bones, now you can just pull it off with a dry towel. And you see how clean it gets with minimal effort? Beautiful. Before the other butchers finish their second primal, Eagle is on his third, the loin. You can get up to three cuts from the loin primal, but we are focused on the loin chops. He goes through the loin. He's making cross marks. He's going to cut those bones. He's just doing straight loin chops. Loin chops are great because they're lean, they're tender, and they're easy to prepare. I like to just season them with a little bit of salt and throw them on the grill. It looks like Lota's still on that shoulder, yeah. but he's getting through it. We have here the nice lamb neck. 15 minutes remaining, butchers. Going to the meat locker. I still have a loin and legs in the cooler. I don't have a lot of time, and this is like the toughest part, chopping through the femur bone. I hit it with the copus blade, no movement. I was just like, holy <laughs> here we go. Look at her, she's just hacking away. That was fun. Eagle headed back to get the legs of his lamb, his final primal. As many as five cuts come from the leg primal, but we're focused on the leg roast, also known as the leg of lamb. We're gonna look for a nice bone-in leg of lamb. Everybody thinks of Christmas holiday mm. season. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful piece of meat to roast. And of all the cuts on lamb, it's the quickest and literally yeah. the easiest one to do. I'm going to clean up the whole leg roast, bone-in, French the shank on that, and tie it up. Eagle making quick work of this leg. Beautiful Frenching. Now he's putting a nice tie on that. So if somebody took that and cook, it will cook nice and even. Judges, we got five minutes left. Now you're starting to see some real hustle. Yes, I'm definitely feeling the time pressure because that lamb is so large. Normally, I would have been done 10 minutes ago with a whole lamb. Eagle on his fourth primal leads Tim in total cuts, followed by Jules. And then there's Lota, still moving at his pace. All right. Eagle just threw down his leg roast. You can see now that Jules is actually doing loin chops. That's your T-bone porterhouse, of the same as any animal, and it's a beautiful cut. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 
One. Time's up. All right, butchers, nice work. Unfortunately for one of you, this will be your last cut. We're gonna have you head to the stock room while the judges come down and inspect your work. That was definitely the biggest lamb I've ever seen. Yes. Those things were, in fact, so large that it ruined my oh, knife. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. What were you cutting with that, the vertebrae? No, I was doing hand-cut lamb loin chops. The knife I have here is a eight to 10 times rolled Damascus steel cleaver given to me by my best friend. And during the challenge, the lamb loin chops got the best of it. Now I gotta get it fixed. Here we are at Eagle's presentation table. He came in with a total of 13 cuts. I'm really liking his leg roast. He did a nice job frenching it. Nice even ties. I like his round bone chops. What you really are looking for is this small bone. See, look at that, that's perfect right there. We were looking for these racks to be French. Eagle didn't the chime chime still it out, on there. didn't take the cap off, didn't French it at all. They're just not complete. Here we are at Tim's table. He has a total of 11 cuts. One of the things that I like is his French rack. Chine off, well trimmed, nice tying on it. What I really like that Tim did is these neck cuts. He cross cut them, nicely oh. trimmed. On the offside, his round bone chops, he just kind of went too deep into the arm. You can see that giant bone right here. You can't sell that for $16.99 a pound as a chop. You'd clean it up and use it for stew meat and get $13.99 a pound for it. But as it stands right now, you're not gonna be able to sell it for anything. All right, judges. Jules came in with a total of 10 cuts. I am liking her rolling chops. They're nice and even, really pretty. I think they look great. Really nice job on these lamb necks. Nice even cuts, you know, that's the benefit of that bandsaw, taking full advantage of the equipment. I do not like this rack. Not only did she not French it, really nice. We got a lot of meat on these bones, but just cut way too close to the she side. Right. So I should not be seeing this meat mm -hmm. on the side. Mm -hmm. It should have been coming up a little bit about right here. You never cut into that eye. That's where your money is. And broken bone. And it's not churned. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to cut through that at all. I think it was mainly for me was just like the time. Yeah. Getting the, the cuts really good, mm -hmm. getting them really neat. This is Lotar's presentation table. He has eight cuts. I like that he got so much yield out of the neck. <laughs> I mean, that's like a giraffe neck. Maybe spent a little too much time getting to it, but absolutely yeah. beautiful. I spent too much time with the front quarter. Well, I was thinking to get the most beautiful cuts out of this piece of meat. I do not care for the shank. He left the bones. The bones are here. It should have been cut off. And it looks like he miscut and actually just retied re re the meat Interesting. back mm -hmm. on. Are you ready to make your decisions? Yeah. Yes, right, we are. Let's, do let's bring the butchers back in. Best of luck, guys. Okay, okay. That wasn't awkward. Butchers, you all did great work, but you all had some cuts that were rejected. The butcher with the fewest number of cuts is going home. The butcher with the fewest number of cuts is going home. Eagle, after the judges inspected your work, you came up with a final cut count of 12 cuts. Tim, you had a final count of 10 cuts. Congratulations to the two of you. You're both moving on. You can head back to your workstations. Jules, Lotar, it comes down to the two of you. Lotar, you finished with a total of seven cuts. Jules, you finished with a total of eight cuts. Congratulations. You can head back to your block. Lothar, you did great. I can tell you've been a butcher for a long time. Great knife work, but your four shank was just not tied well and not trimmed up to spec. Otherwise, great display. Love your personality, and you know I wish you the best. Lothar, thank you for being here, but it is time for you to leave the shop. Bye. I was going out with tears in one eye, but I'm happy of the another eye on the smile. Does young butchers go in the next round? And this makes me proud. Butchers, the $10,000 prize is within your reach, but two more challenges stand in your way. As you know, excellent customer service is key to keeping your businesses thriving. In fact, I bet you have customers that have been coming to your shop for years for that very reason. You probably know their orders so well that you don't even have to ask them what they want when they step up to your counter. That's why we call this next challenge, Know Your Customer. You're each going to start with a chuck primal and a bone-in pork loin. 
From there, you will break those down into cuts for your favorite customer, Sully. Here's Sully's order. One and three quarter pounds of one inch cube beef stew meat, four evenly cut boneless pork chops totaling one pound, and one three pound chuck roast. After each cut, you will take it to Sully who will then weigh it. Here's the kicker. You're not gonna get to see how much it weighs. If your cut is over, you will have the opportunity to go back and correct it. But if your cut is under, it will be rejected. No scale. Oh, <laughs> how am I going to do that? And it has to be exact. In the event that you run out of chuck primal or pork loin, you're going to have to head back into the meat locker and get another one. The first two butchers to deliver exactly what the customer ordered will advance to the next round where you will go head to head in our final challenge. I'm thinking, excellent. I do that all the time. This is a perfect challenge for me. All right, let's do this. Butchers, ready? Sit, cut. Dave, what's gonna be the most difficult part for these butchers in this challenge? You know, figuring out that weight without a scale is mentally a tough one. And make sure that your cubes are the right size because when you come back, if your cubes are too big and you're just pulling one, you're yes. pulling one, you could be under quite quickly. My strategy for the shoulder cloth is to cut it in half, reveal all the grains, and then trim around it. It's really interesting watching here different styles. Eagles, he's trying to get that claw in her out, get it really well cleaned up. Tim has got some straight cross steaks. Clean up this fat. He doesn't want all that chunks of fat. It looks like Jules has already got some cubes on the table ready yeah. to roll. Nice cubes. It's beautiful. That's what you want. The way the challenge is designed, this is one of those where you definitely want to overshoot if you're going to do anything. Right. Right. If you're under, you got to start all over again. Yep. Jules already. She's almost ready to go see Sully. Mm-hmm. Tim's already plating some of his cubed meat. Eagle down there just whittling away. The biggest challenge with a shoulder clod is cleaning off some of that silver skin. Because if I leave that on the stew pieces, a Sully will probably send it back. Jules is the first one going up to Sully. Yeah, that's right. She needs to come in at one and three quarter pounds. Your stew meat is under. Oh. oh. That means Jules is going to have to start over. I have to go and do it all over again and recut. That just really just killed my time. <sighs> First, you will cut one and three quarter pounds of one inch cube beef stew meat, four evenly cut boneless pork chops totaling one pound, and one three pound chuck roast. Jules, she's got to start cutting those one inch cubes again. Being over is good, but being under is bad. So now, let me try to aim to be over. Eagle, the second butcher to make his way up to Sully. Tim, now getting in line behind Eagle. Eagle, my order is under. Eagle, oh, also man. underweight. Exactly what I didn't want it to be, under. Just like Jules, he's going to have to start over. Tim, looks like my order is over. All right, he's got you, the sir. ability to go back, make adjustments. Problem is, he doesn't know how much overweight. Right. How much does this weigh? Come back. Looks like Tim pulled two cubes off. Tim, my order is now under. Oh, Should have pulled one. I'm very annoyed at myself. You could have just taken one piece off, but you took two off. All right, I really want Jules to just find some meat, cube it up, and get on yeah. the board. Come on, girl. I have to do stew meat all the time in my store. Once you have your perfect starter piece, all you have to do is line it up and replicate it as many times as you need to. It's the most effective and efficient way to do it. Tim, the first one to head back up to Sully. Tim, you have made weight. Let me look for quality. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you for my order of stew. Thank you, sir. There you go. Moving on to the second part of the challenge, we are looking for four boneless pork chops totaling one pound. My plan of attack is I'm going to take that pork loin out, I'm going to debone it as fast as possible, and then I'm just going to cut quarter-inch pork chops and see where I stand. Why is this skill set so important as a butcher? Because you have this customer that needs something that is so wildly specific. If you blow through an entire pork loin trying to cut two chops, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to sell such a custom cut mm -hmm. right. again. Mm -hmm. And that's just wasted money for your shop. Money down the drain. Eagle, up at Sully's scale, weighing in. Eagle, you're over. Tough customer, Sully. I'm taking a chunk off. I'm going back up. I know I got to hit it sooner or later. You're still over on my order. Eagle's still heavy on his weight. Come on, Jules. Jules, 
You're over on my order. Sounds like good news to me. Oh, Jules, don't do too much, girl. Put the knife away. Just pluck you. Eagle heads back to Sully. It's got to be right around there, man. Eagle, thank you for my beautiful order. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, Eagle on the board. Finally, stupid stew meat takes so long. Like, I almost chucked those stew chunks at his head. Tim now, he's weighing his pork chops. Looks like my chops are over my one pound request. The pork chops, it's really deceivingly thin. These are such a tough thing to cut. I mean, four in a pound, super thin. The challenge is not that easy. All right, Jules, back up. Jules, I'm over. Oh, mm. she's really gonna have to play catch up at this point. I'm trying not to get discouraged. Guys are past stew, now they are pork chop. And I'm still at stew beef. Eagle with his pork chops. That's bold eagle right there. Let's see if he can jump <laughs> into the lead here. Beautiful pork chops, Eagle, but they are over. All right, Jules. I feel it. Jules, you're now under. Oh. Oh. I don't understand. Am I measuring wrong? Is my cube still big? It's just frustrating at this point. Deep breath. <laughs> All right, let's go. Try these pork chops, buddy. Eagle. Thank you for my order. Oh, oh one pound. All right. Oh. Welcome, sir. Enjoy those. There you go. Eagle now has two of the three parts of his order complete. This next challenge, they have to cut a three pound chuck roast, trimmed up and ready to go. I don't care how good you are, it's gonna take a few minutes to get this. It's a big piece of meat. With a chuck, I'm going to push against the feather bones to score those off, and then get between the rib bones to pull that eye away from the spine. Come on up, Tim. I think I'm almost right there. Tim. Thank you for my order. There One you go. Pound yeah. of chops. He's now moving on to the third part of this challenge. I'm down to my chuck eye roast. I make the cut where I think it's gonna hit that three pound mark, clean off a little bit of the edges, get back up to Sully. Eagles hoping to be three pounds. Jules anxiously standing behind him. What do you think of that roast, sir? Beautiful. You know, Eagle? Yes, sir. This is a beautiful roast. And it is the correct weight. Oh, wow. First and shot. And his first oh, eagle. Attempt. One time. Yes. I hit it. First shot. Such a good feeling. I am super excited to be moving on to the final round. Feels good. Jules, we're still over. OK. If this chuck roast comes in at three pounds, he's moving into the finals. Tim. Thank you for completing my order. Oh, oh man. Oh. That's it. Oh, girl. And with that, Tim is moving on. First trip, we're on the money. I'm ready to win this $10,000. Roxanne, any final words for Jules? Jules, it was really a pleasure to watch you here. We were all so impressed by how well you did on Thank the you. lamb for having it be your second lamb yeah. ever. And I don't want this to discourage you in any way, shape, or form. Keep that attitude up, you know, keep pushing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jules, great effort, but unfortunately, it is time for you to leave the shop. All right. You guys are great. I can't believe I'm here just doing this and doing what I love. I'm young in my craft, so I can only get better in time. And I'm looking forward to the next few years in this industry. Congratulations, Tim and Eagle. At the end of this next challenge, one of you will be taking home the $10,000 and the title of champion. Clearly, I'm hiding something behind this big old black curtain, and you're probably saying to yourself right now, what the hell have I gotten myself into? And to that, I say, meet the beast. Oh! oh. <laughs> You're probably saying to yourself right now, what the hell have I gotten myself into? And to that, I say, meet the beast. Oh, elk. Oh my. Wow, this elk is huge. This is gonna be something very new and something very interesting. Yeah, always wanted to do game, and I can't believe it's an elk. The elk is one of the largest land roaming mammals in North America, standing tall at over five feet with antlers that can hit heights of a whopping nine feet. Elk can tip the scales above 1,000 pounds. A member of the deer family, it's estimated that more than 10 million elk roam North America prior to European colonization. 
They played an important role in Native American culture as they were a proven source of food. Some tribes used the hides to cover their teepees and their ivory teeth for jewelry. As butchers, you know the cornerstone of this business is to get the most value out of your meat with as little waste as possible. Using your skills as master butchers, you are to yield as much meat from the animal as you can and turn it into quality retail cuts. In the hands of a skilled butcher, even elk stew meat can be worth more than $15 a pound. In the end, the judges will assess the quality of your cuts, weigh the worthy pieces, and then add up the total dollar value of your yield. You have two hours and 30 minutes for this challenge. The butcher who has the highest value is gonna win it all. All right, butchers, let's do this. Ready, set, cut. What are gonna be the keys to getting a good yield from the carcass? You gotta first start off at the proper break. Getting the right cut on your primals coming off. Staying close to that bone, not leaving any meat on that bone. I'm gonna try to attack this like a really large lamb. Take this neck off. Try to get at the other primals a little bit later. I really like how Eagle went about taking the neck off first. Mm -hmm. But Tim is splitting that in half, which I think that's a smart move. Yeah, totally two different styles to start out. My plan of attack, I just kind of split it in half, and I want to break it all into primals so they're easy, manageable pieces. We talked about how sticky venison meat can be. Mm -hmm. Elk's even more so with yeah. all the irons. Not only is it bigger, but just the way the knife cuts it is totally different than almost any other animal. Eagle, look, oh, look how much damn. weight that is. Oh, yeah. It takes everything I have to get this shoulder onto the cart. Regardless of whether you've done an elk before, you should be able to identify where your road map is. There's backstrap, you can do a French rack, and there are hidden cuts such as the oyster steak, but it can end up in ground meat if you don't know to look for it. Eagle with the contemplation over there. Yeah. Now what? Yeah, breather. I look over at the bandsaw and I look at the shoulder. This is not gonna fit. I'm gonna have to make this shoulder smaller in order to get it on the bandsaw. I take the arm off. Now, now we see Tim. And here's the advantage of him splinting all that. <laughs> Go back to my table. Look how much easier it is to deal with just one side. Because these are such big animals, you're gonna want to split it so it's in more manageable pieces. How are you doing, dude? Doing great. I'm trying to keep everything as normal as possible, just like I would be in my store. I'm coming out of the cooler with the rib section, so that's my short ribs, my belly or breast, and the ribeye section. As I go to the bandsaw, my goal is to cut even elk rib chops. Flat iron. Finally, the shoulder is small enough to go to the bandsaw. Butchers, 30 minutes in, two hours remaining put this oyster steak out. So a little piece I'm cutting out is known today as the oyster steak. It's a real rarity. It's one of those steaks butchers take home for themselves nowadays. It looks like he just pulled the oyster steak. It's great for grilling and it's tender too. It makes great tartare. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. Is he rolling the paper into the thing? He did. As I'm going through this elk shoulder, I choose to do a bone-in brisket, and that is meant for like kind of barbecue. And then a boneless brisket, presenting the same muscle in different ways, hit more of that yield factor for the judges to score on. That brisket is beautiful. Tie this up into a boneless sirloin roast. Easy tying his top sirloin up. Yes. You leave a bunch of silver skin on top or do you clean? It's like there's some that's kind of tucked under there. Yeah. Butchers, we are halfway through this challenge. 75 minutes remaining. I'm cleaning up these crosscut shanks, otherwise known as asabuco, Italian for bone with a hole. That's good value at about $40 a pound. I see a meat case forming. It's nice. Neck roast. Now you see he's removing that spinal column yep. from the neck. Cooking that would have been horrible. Mm. Right. It's a sirloin tip roast, little medallions. Making medallions out of the sirloin is a great way to add value to your table. I think, Dave, at this point, both butchers still believe they're going to be able to finish? Just less than an hour left? No. I'm really feeling the time crunch. I'm not going to be able to get through this whole elk. I think they're feeling the pressure. Mm -hmm. This elk is killing me. I pulled that tenderloin out, and I'm sawing this guy, hoping that it's going to stay connected. That thing's going to fall. Yeah, this is not going to be light. There it is. Oh, oh my god. We're at the 40 minute mark, guys. There are 40 minutes remaining. The butcher who has the highest overall value, gonna win it all. I can't believe I dropped my meat. 
Seeing this rib and loin, I know I'm gonna run into the problem again on the bandsaw. This sucker's not gonna fit. I start to do the tenderloin. Tenderloin medallions. I gotta get as much off of this as possible. Right now, I'm working on my bavette. It's an awesome cut for display. It does look very bavette-ish. Where does the bavette come from? Bavette's considered one of the flat meats, so it comes from inside the rib cage. Long piece of meat that you could hand sear. Eagle, now working on the back strap. Back strap. He's cutting them into ribeyes. Both of them putting in a great effort, I gotta say. 15 minutes, guys. Elk ribeye. I know that we're asking them for the most value on the table, but I see so much meat still hanging in the walk-in, and what I want to see is that hustle. I mean, Tim has given up on even touching the other half. I look at Eagle's table, I see that he has a lot of stuff on it. In my mind, I just know that I can't get to that other half of elk, so I want to make everything as beautiful and perfect as possible. Hey, Sully, all this stew is for you, buddy. <laughs> Putting the stew meat down, smart. It's quick to use a lot of this meat up. One minute left. I am disappointed that we're not going to see any elk burgers, and I'm disappointed about not seeing any French rack. I see the other half of the neck I have on the table. I'm going to try to score some points any way I can. 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. Butchers. Now it's time to assess the value of your work. Roxanne is also going to make some selections from your table and put it through the cut and chew test. So you guys hang out in the stock room while they do their thing. Roxanne, have you decided which cut you would like to cook for us? Yeah, I think I'm going to do the uh, chops from both of the guys. Uh, Tim left his bone in. Eagle did boneless. So okay. we'll kind of see how those shake up together. Excellent. If either doesn't cook well, it will be rejected and its value lost. I honestly don't know how it's going to go because I felt like I processed a lot. You're definitely going to win on presentation. Just looking at the tables, though, mine was stuffed. Yeah, yeah. All right, gentlemen, here we are at Tim's table. He only got half the animal done, but he did try to represent from one end to the other. I think his chops are beautiful, and they're nice and even. He went right between each rib. On his roast here, I would have gone ahead and trimmed off all this dark bit before I tied it off. Putting that in your meat case, nobody's going to buy this one. The one thing I really do like is all the small muscles he did pull. The oyster steak, which is a great cut, pulling this off showing to us because he knew that we all would know what this cut <laughs> is. So a little bit of attention to detail I really like. So here's Tim's chop, and here's Eagle's chop. These are the exact same cut. One just has the bone in. So with elk, I do cook these close to rare. Everything is either going to be rare or braised, just because it's tough. Now here we are at Eagle's presentation. For one, we totally different displays. I would have liked to see the paper trimmed a little bit more. It looks a little bit scattered. I like the boneless ribeyes. You saw him pulling that whole back strap out. He'd cut nice slices off of it. These are beautiful. They're going to cook up really nice. All this stew meat, very smart, taking value and putting it in your case. He boned out that neck. It's got a bunch of blood on it right here. If you're in a hurry, you could have just cut that whole piece off. I would never, ever put this in my case. You've got two butchers obviously taking two completely different approaches. Tim got into that really, really, really fine detail stuff. Eagles started putting stuff out as like quicker than he maybe should have. So we've got Eagles and Tim's chops here. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull Tim's off the bone. So slicing through Tim's, you can see we're cutting kind of across the grain on here. Now I'm slicing through Eagles. They slice pretty much equally. So after the cut and chew test, because these are both uh, of, of equal high quality, both of these butchers will have these cuts added to their total value. If I win the $10,000, it would be my seed money for a food truck and put my butcher shop's message on wheels. We support our local farmers. We support our local communities by being the one outlet you can go to and actually feel good about buying meat. Whole Animal Butchery spoke to me, just the utilization of every part of the animal. I really want to show my friends and family it is something that I am passionate about, that I am good at, and that this is a career. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It's great meeting you. Well, have you determined which butcher has the highest value? Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's bring our butchers back into the shop. Butchers, this is one of the closest competitions we have had. You two are separated by $31. Tim, your display was on point, but you did leave a lot of meat hanging in that locker. Your final value, $1,487.
Eagle, you had a lot of creative cuts and you got more primals off your elk, but there is a lot of meat still sitting on your block. Your value, $1,456. Congratulations, Tim. Nice. Well done. Eagle, love watching you butcher. Pulling those big pieces, it's literally manhandling. But at the end of the day, your cuts should have been cleaner. He boned out that neck. It's got a bunch of blood on it right here. It was the details that really cost you. For your first elk, really great job. You should be really proud. Thank you. Eagle, thank you for being here, but it is time for you to leave the shop. What's up, bud? Thanks, man. I may have lost today, but it's a good takeaway, and it's a great learning experience. It just makes me a better butcher for it. The bald eagle is going to keep soaring high and, you know, live to fight another day. Tim, congratulations, man. Thank you just won $10,000. Thanks. Yeah. How are you feeling? I feel great. I feel great. Tim, at the end of the day, it was your attention to detail. Your display was beautiful. Thank you. What I really liked was the variety and the attention to detail is outstanding. Congratulations once again. We got your money waiting over there, brother. Thank you, guys. How about it? Good luck, man. I feel so good right now. I feel like this giant weight is off my shoulders. It just validated my belief in myself that I care for this art more than anybody else. And being the fact that I won, this has been a really awesome experience.